بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم From my mum's side, I'm third generation Australian. My dad on first. Um, I'm only 20 years old and I've been brought up in Australia my whole life. I, I was brought up to be kind of prejudiced and so I always had a bad view about Muslims. So, you know, 9 11 happened, I thought they were all terrorists and I was brought up, you know, to believe that. I was brought up to be a Christian. But by Christian, it means I could still go out and drink and do everything because I believe that Jesus died for my sins and I was forgiven. So it's not very... <laughs> yeah, I was never brought up strict religious. I used to go to a youth group in scripture, but that was my own will. Uh, well, for two years, I was actually a bartender in a nightclub. And one night, I met a patron who was Muslim. And he, he wasn't practicing because he was clubbing. And we actually became really good friends. And through him, I met his friend who's now my husband but with him he used to be like he used to try and tell me about Islam I'm like don't bother I don't want to be Muslim that's not something I want you know it's crazy and then he kept saying he's like just read just read something about Islam I'm like I don't want to read and he's like just please try and I was like fine I'll do it for the sake of you and so I read a book and I kept reading and I kept looking at videos and I kept researching and I started to realize that they're not crazy terrorists like the media portrays. They're actually like peaceful and they're happy. He got the number for a revert that's in Perth and so I went to go see her that week and I met her and just seeing how happy she was and her family was and she told me about Islam and by the end of it, I was sitting down with her for about three hours, I almost started crying. And she stopped, she's like, you're going to cry? I'm like, no, no, I'm fine, I'm fine. But it's like I was looking for something my whole life, and meeting her is when I found it, and what I found was Islam. And so I embraced it, I took my Shahada on Eid this year, and started wearing hijab every day. And my dad, he kind of frowned upon it, but he still speaks to me. And my mum, it took her a few weeks, but she saw how happy I was and she didn't want to like she didn't want to say I oh, don't want you to be happy so it has changed for the better and I am really really happy and <laughs> and all I want is support from you but if you don't understand that's okay because I've met so many other sisters and brothers and family here. But at the same time, I still want my parents and my grandparents. And the ones that have accepted me, I'm so thankful for. And I'm so happy. And this is a lifetime commitment I want to have. In the name of Allah, the most beneficent and the most merciful. Assalamu alaikum. My name is Emilia Momokwa. I'm from South Africa. I moved to the United States in 2007. Um, I was always intrigued. I've been living here for four years and something, there was something missing. I just didn't know what it was and I just started going to the mosque. And I was there every Friday but I still had questions. There wasn't anybody in the mosque to like ask, like answer my questions because obviously everybody comes to Juma prayer and after that everybody, some people have to rush back to work. So I didn't really know who I can talk to. So I started doing some research, watching videos, and then I came, I was looking for Dawah centers close to my area and I came across the Y Islam center. So I came in here and I had a nice long conversation with the sister and then I took my Shahada. And ever since then, Y Islam has been really helpful. 
um, they offer Arabic classes online, so you don't have to like come in every day. If you have like a really busy schedule, you can just log in. And they also offer um, start beginners classes for um, new Muslims, which has been really helpful. And they have a very uh, a little of a it's like a family because when I found out that um, my father had passed away, I actually called this place first, and I came here and I spoke with the lady upstairs. So they've been really helpful. I feel like a new person. Um, it's definitely my life has changed a lot, which has been good. I obviously pray, and that's been very, very helpful, especially after my father passed away. I remember the first thing I did was I prayed, and that like helped. It was like a soothing, a comforting thing. That was the hard part because obviously, you know, my mom's Christian and she also has her other traditional beliefs. So she didn't really understand why I took it and why I became Muslim. But she's now eventually starting to understand. And I had told my dad, mashallah, before he passed away. And he was just happy with it. He was always just about you have to pray. But my mom was hard to like let her know, you know, that because people, obviously, the first thing they're going to go is like, oh, it's a strict religion. Why would you do that? But, you know, every religion is strict. That's how I see it. I think the challenges that I faced after taking Shahada was I was always a little bit, um, how can I say, not confident when I'm saying like the Surah Al-Fatiha, like when you're doing the Salah and you're praying because you're like, oh my goodness, am I saying these words correctly? And then like, am I getting distracted? I hope it's, you know, correct. So I've, you know, those are the problems, like pronouncing the words correctly and making sure everything is the right way is like one of the problems that I've faced. But other than that, I think I've had a good support system. The website was kind of just a guide to say, okay, come to Why Islam Center. And when I got here, that's when I, all the questions that I had to ask, you know, um, we spoke about it. But the books are definitely a good guide as well because there's um, a book, like a history book that they give you, like stuff that was discovered in the Quran way before scientists even discovered, which I thought was really cool. So that stuff is also very helpful. The video is very good because the video starts off with a story about the Prophet Muhammad. So that helps you understand how he got the Quran. And then the video shows you a step-by-step -step way of how you should do the Salah, how to do Wudu, which is helpful because I think visual helps you instead of just reading it. It helps you to keep up to date with how you should do Salah and how you should do Wudu if ever you get lost. And then they also give you flashcards. So when you're praying, you can put the flashcards on the floor, and if you don't understand it, you can read until you finally get to memorize like the Surah Al-Fatiha. But until then, you have pictures right next to the flashcards to show you what you should do. So the visual helps a lot. I would, if you're like looking for information and not sure yet, I would say still look. But also it's like, for me personally, how I felt is like if you if you're sure about something and that's the path you want to follow, I think you should take your shahada and then follow the steps of being with people that are going to help you and guide you through it and stuff. Because if you are not, sh if you constantly like just looking, 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 you'll never fully understand. That's how I've always, how I feel about it. That's the very, it's, I've always, like, because I come from a country, South Africa, where we've had Muslims and you catch a, a, a train or a taxi with someone that's wearing a hijab and it's not a problem. But here in the United States, people stay. Even when I come back from Juma, people look at me and you're like, I'm not oppressed. You know, I'm not oppressed. I'm wearing this because I want to wear it. After taking my shahada, though, then I notice that, oh my goodness, a lot more things are happening that is not, you know, that is not right, that I feel is not right. I think everybody has the right to practice their religion. But I mean, in America, I feel for some reason, they don't give us Muslims enough freedom to practice our religion. It's like you always have, you like just constantly, oh my God, am I going to get stopped at the airport? And this is why Islam was so appealing to me, was because it was a religion where it was quite conservative. And obviously nothing like that really exists in Britain anymore. While most girls in Britain wear what they want, Practicing Muslim women often wear hijab, a headscarf and long loose clothing. So what if you have to wear a long dress and, and, you know, cover yourself modestly? It's good dressing, you know, it's like, why would you want to get everything out 
Do you know what I mean? It's, it's, what's the point? You know, who are you trying to prove to? If you're really okay with yourself, who cares where you are? I'm a very fashionable person, but I'll do it with my own style. Things won't be out, my legs won't be out, my bum won't be out, do you get what I mean? But I still look really nice. There's a way of dressing that looks nice and modest, modestly, you know. And it says in the Quran that a woman can chase knowledge if she wishes. You know, it's like everybody gets really excited because um, I'm like a newborn Muslim and everybody's like, oh, will you pray for me? Will you pray oh. for me? How long have you been wearing the headscarf? I kind of experimented with it. I've got to be honest. I kind of put a scarf on my hair. I wondered, like, hmm, can I do this, you know? But it's like, there are Muslims out there that didn't even wear hijabs, you know? Like, yeah. like you, you know, it's hard, you know what I mean? It's like, yeah. you don't have to wear it. Kuma Mae Concern, Clay Louise Evans. AKA Safia. <laughs> um, uh, this is to certify that Ms. Claire Louise Evans Safia has been embraced and accepted Islam, uh, Islam as a religion on August 2012. <laughs> the feeling you get when you pray is, is much different when you just put your hands together. Something washes over you. It's like the deepest meditation that you can think of. Prayer is like four until five. I, I gotta be honest, I don't know who goes up at 4 24 in the morning. Do you get what I mean? You know, <laughs> you got to be really dedicated to do that. Because although I love to pray, I love my sleep as well. So I kind of always miss this. But like, I always like make up for it later. So I don't know if you're supposed to do that, but I'm probably really naughty Muslim. Still haven't opened this. I was kind of afraid to open it in case it got dirty. It like shows you which way <laughs> to pray and stuff. It's really ironic, actually. It's supposed to be for Islams, and yet it says made in China. <laughs> It's my book and like how to do prayers and stuff, you know, it's just got like like what are you supposed to say and go all that sort of stuff in it, you know. So yeah, so whenever I start praying I always have that in front of me and I do it really slowly because like I can't do it really fast because like obviously I'm new and I want to do a Dear human. I am talking to you as a human. It does not matter whether you're Christian, Jew, Buddhist, or Hindu. It does not matter whether you are a worshiper of idols, atheist, religious, secularist, a man, or a woman. I talk and address you as a human. Have you ever stopped and asked yourself one day the reason why you believe in what you believe in? Have you ever thought about the reason for which you chose the religion you practice? If you are a Christian, have you ever thought why you believe that Jesus Christ is the only way for eternal salvation? Does salvation require the crucifixion of the godly prophet? Does God need to sacrifice himself to redeem others? Do you really believe that your God is not one, and that they are three, such as a Father, Son, and Holy Spirit? How come one entity is three entities at the same time? According to what church or point of view? What is the proof to that? Is the Bible really the Word of God? Is all of it the Word of God? Did it remain the same over time without any change like addition or omission? Which apostle of Jesus should his book and life be followed and why? Did you really ask yourself these questions or some of them? What is the fate of one who opposes and why? What is the position of the Christian who follows another church for you? Have you ever asked what are the only principles through which you can decide which beliefs are right and worthy of following? What are the measures? How to agree regarding them? You who believe in Judaism, have you ever stopped and thought, what are the right foundations of faith and why do you have them in your belief while others do not have them? Why should the center of your faith be to believe that God, Jehovah, or Elohim, is only for you. Why do you believe in him thinking that he made a sin and that he still cries because of feeling guilty until now? Can the one who cries, regrets and wails be a God? 
What is the proof of your faith? Is the Torah agreed upon by all sects of the Jews? Do you even all agree upon the definition of the Jew? Is the promise of God only given to the Jews? Why is that? What is the fate of the other Jewish sects that do not agree with you? Also, what is the fate of other religions for you? You who believe in Hinduism, are you sure that the right and acceptable shape of the cycle of life is reincarnation? Is this acceptable for all the people? What is the fate of those who do not believe in it? Is the emotional feeling the right way to measure faith? Is your holy book void of any addition or omission? You who believe in Buddhism, do you really have the proof that Buddha is the son of God and the savior of humanity from all their miseries and pains, that he carries all their sins and he will be back to relieve the world of all the evils and sins? You who claim that you do not believe in God, who created you? Who made you from nothing? Why are you created? So, you are born and then you die and become forgotten? Do you like to live in such state? Every human has to believe in some power to return to regarding the method of his life and to look up to in case of fear and upon death. My brother in humanity, you are so sure of your faith. You know that it is the true religion and anything else is false. All the other religions are wrong. So, you are ready to bet with your immortal spirit on this assumption. Yet, did you stop to think carefully about the fact that there are more than 24 official religions and hundreds of beliefs practiced on this planet? Do you know that Christianity includes more than 450,000 sects? All of them claim to understand the ultimate truth better than the rest. Do you realize that every member in a practiced belief is a pious and honest person just like you? Do you know that his faith is as firm as your faith? Do you know that they also read the sacred texts with certainty too? Do you know that they have confirmed justifications? They have known miracles beyond their measures and opinions. They feel the existence of God and his faint voice. They follow his perfect advice with obedience for their life. They love him in an indescribable way. They can also defend their belief in the same enthusiasm with which you defend your belief. You contradict with them about both the big and small issues. They cannot all be right. Is that not correct? What are the measures which the rational people agree upon and which they can use to measure the nature of the true religion? Some of these measures are belief in God. The human has to believe in a deity. He can call him God or he can call him anything else. He can be a tree, planet, woman, image, or a singer he is passionate about. So, the human has to believe in something that he would follow and cherish. He would refer to him in his method of life. He might even die for him, and this is what we call worship. As for the true God, he is a creator. He knows the hidden and concealed matters. He is all-knowing of the unseen. He has the power and will, and he makes all things happen according to what he wills. He is wise. He does not do anything except for certain wisdom. He is just, and because of his justice, he rewards and punishes. He has a link with humans. He will not be their Lord if he creates them and then abandons them. This is why he sends messengers to them to clarify the right path for them and to notify humans of his method. The one who follows this method will be worthy of getting the reward and the one who leaves it will be worthy of punishment. There has to be a place for the reward, which is paradise, and a place for punishment, which is the hellfire. If he is not capable of admitting them in either of these places, then he is not a god. The religion. 
We need an accurate definition of religion because if it is a method for life and the path to the afterlife, it has to have attributes to consider it as the true religion. One, it has to be close to the basic nature of humans, which represents all the good qualities and traits in humans. Two, consistency. It has to be a consistent religion for all generations, countries, and all kinds of humans. It has to be a religion that does not increase or decrease according to desires. Three, the beliefs of this religion have to be clear and evident. There should be no visible and invisible matters, and this religion should not be a mediator. The religion should not be taken based on mere spiritualities. It has to have an evident and reliable proof. Four, the religion has to tackle all issues of life at every time. It has to be suitable for life and also the afterlife. It has to build the body and it should not forget the spirit as well. Five, this religion has to protect the life of the people and their honors. There has to be no unlawful mixing of lineages and it has to protect their wealth. Islam is in conformity with the creation and nature of humans. There is no contradiction between Islam and the nature of humans. And this is why it is the religion of the natural disposition. Almighty God has created the human and defined the method for him to follow. This method is commensurate with the nature and needs of the human. This method is the religion. Whoever does not follow this religion will be in a state of chaos, instability, and spiritual and psychological discomfort, in addition to the torture in the afterlife. The Islamic religion has clear beliefs. It is not satisfied with establishing the commands and teachings by abstract obligation and strict dictation. Islam does not say like other beliefs, believe blindly, or believe then no, or close your eyes then follow me. Islam does not only address the heart and spirit and depend on them as a foundation for belief, it also explains the matters with evident and convincing reasoning, clear proof, and true justification that persuade the mind and reach the hearts. The Quran is the book of God and his words. It did not change despite the passing of hundreds of years and despite the dissimilarities among countries and civilizations. It is still the same as it was revealed. It is still leading the Muslims in their worldly life and their path to the afterlife. The Quran establishes proofs about the matter of divinity from the universe, the spirit, the history of the existence of God, his oneness and completeness. It also establishes proofs in terms of resurrection. It proves the potential of creating humans, creating the heavens and the earth, and reviving the land after her death. It shows God's wisdom through justice in rewarding the good doer and punishing the bad doer. The Islamic religion is complete for all matters of life. It is flexible because it is close to the human nature, which God has created humans according to her rulings. There is no Muslim that does not know the signs of the truth. The universe leads him to the oneness of God Almighty. What the messenger, peace be upon him, brought proves his truthfulness and prophethood. The Muslim knows quite well that whoever said that God is the third of three is misleading and astray. Also, who said that God felt tired and rested on Saturday after the creation of the heavens and the earth is a misled disbeliever? The Muslim also sees clearly the disbelief of the idol worshippers and their delusion. The deluded atheists are even worse. The human does not know the truth about his spirit and being. He does not know the future that he will face, and this is why the human being was not able to put permanent legislations and laws to fit every time and place. But the Almighty Creator is the all-knowing. He is the fully aware of the creation of humans. He is the all-knowing of what happened in the past, what happens in the present, and what will happen in the future. This is why no human can bring a permanent flexible sharia or legislations that would fit every time and place 
unless this human is a messenger from his Lord. Is it enough for us that our Islamic Sharia has ruled different cultures? In different countries and at different times for hundreds of years. There has been no problem without a solution in this honorable Sharia. Now, at our modern time, the time of quick developments and outstanding innovations, this meaning is confirmed clearly. Our Sharia proclaimed herself even more in our time, despite the weakness of her people, because Islam conforms to the requirements and needs. Islam can develop without any decay over the centuries. Islam keeps its complete strength of life and flexibility. Islam is the religion that gave the world the most established and affirmed legislations. The Sharia of Islam surpasses any other legislation on the face of the earth. Make these words a starting point. Keep looking. You will arrive through your nature, heart, and mind to God, the perceiver, the initiator, the one and the creator of everything, because you are looking for the religion that would lead and introduce you to him.